My name is Josiah Houston, and I am a member of Team Hercules here at WPAA-TV. Tonight, we are speaking with our honored guest, Kevin Markowski, as we celebrate his long and storied career as the Record Journal's freelance editorial cartoonist for the last 41 years. Good evening, Kevin. It's a pleasure to be speaking with you this evening. Well, thank you for having me. It's an honor. So our first question for you is quite a simple one. Do you remember the first thing that inspired you to start drawing as a child? I guess I don't, other than I was a kid and I drew like all kids do. And um, I mean, I have uh, four younger brothers and a couple younger sisters. So um, there were, you know, pads of paper, crayons, pencils, coloring books uh, all over the house. And so I, I did that uh, as much as anybody, maybe a little more, and um, just kept at it, I guess, when I went through all the various schools. I, so as you were growing up, uh, I do believe it was the golden age of comic books, was. and they were experiencing quite a, quite a surge in popularity, and I imagine as a kid, you might have read a few in your time. I read comic books all the time. So what were your, some of your favorite comic books? Um, I, was, uh, I was a Marvel Comics fan, so awesome. it was uh, Captain America, um, the Hulk, Fantastic Four. Um, I got into DC Comics a little bit later on. Uh, it was a little more lowbrow in my opinion, um, and it was fine with me. I mean, I was just looking to be entertained and see, you know, bright colors, and nicely drawn heroes and stuff. So um, I, most of my friends were loyal only to uh, one. They label chose or a another. team. They chose yeah. a side, and they stuck I, with it. I was okay with both, but mostly Marvel. Yeah. Okay. So, what did comic books perhaps teach you about visual storytelling that you were able to carry into your own work? Um, I, you know, what I do uh, for the most part is not uh, sequential art like graphic novel or even a, a Sunday comic. It's usually single panels, but once in a while I use a multiple panel format. And it just, I think it, um, it taught me about timing that a story uh, unfolds at a certain pace. And, you know, you, there, uh, there are probably subtle rules and unwritten rules about that, but I think they become uh, instinctual after a, a while. And, um, you know, I, I may try to do more of that in the near future because I'm going to have some a lot more free time soon. So awesome! So perhaps a return to some long form projects, possibly. Because in our in our research of your past history, we did come across a college comic strip known as Timmy the Human Dime. Where, where did Where did you find? Who that? was powered by gamma rays, which does sound a little bit close to Marvel's uh, yes, Hulk, of course. I believe. Yeah, I mean, at, at that point, I was a senior in college, so I was, I was a little self mockery. I mean, I, I, I. Uh, bought into the, you know, gamma rays could change everybody into a, you know, Spider-Man or into a rubbery guy. The scientific catch-all for yeah, any, any sure. problem, right? Yeah, sure. So, um, so that actually ended up being um, a kind of a senior project at Wesleyan, where I went to college. And um, there were, there was nobody in the um, studio art department who was a cartoonist that could teach me uh, cartooning and in, in particular um, sequential art. So. Oh. Um, they allowed me to um, create an independent uh, study a class with a, there just happened to be um, a lawyer at a big law firm, um, his name was Ray Andrews, taking a year sabbatical to be a cartoonist. Oh, just wow. at the time, the right time. How serendipitous. Right, it was. And so my father knew one of his partners who um, connected me with him and he agreed to do it. So, um, so you had a full independent study with someone who was a Once a, a week I'd go to his house, bring all my material there and he taught me, um, you know, some good tricks and devices about uh, just everything, shading, lettering. So just real professional insights that you might not have been able to glean without, you know, going into the world and figuring them out for right. yourself. I mean, he was the first professional cartoonist I ever met. Oh, wow. And he did it on the side, the way I've done it on the side for 41 years. So he was almost a role model in the same instance where, like, you, you kind of took the same approach of... Keeping I never knew I would, but yeah. I, we don't yeah, always make those we don't always make those decisions. You can't see it. You can't see it unless you see it. Unless you see it. So he was might have been the first one that you saw do it, mm -hmm. and he went, "Oh, this is an option yeah. for me." Huh? Yeah. So I know that for um, myself, when I'm a writer, and as a young writer, it took me years of of mimicking, you know, writers that I respected, in order to try to really find my own voice and style. Now I, I imagine the process was probably similar for your development as an artist. Um, what great illustrators and cartoonist did you turn to for inspiration as you were finding your artistic identity? In the early years, I mean, I read the uh, the Sunday Funnies, every inch of it, you know, and the they, papers were this big back then. Now they're, you know, my 13-year-old yeah. daughter, it warms my heart to see her go for the Funnies uh, on Sunday, but I feel bad for her because she's reading these, you almost need a, 
a magnifying glass to see them now. It's but, not the heyday of like uh, the big open. You and know, there were fewer of them, I think, too. But anyway, so yeah, I was reading those all the time. And of course, Peanuts, Charles Schultz was probably the one I paid the most attention to. And um, around probably high school years, um, I started to uh, become interested in uh, comic artists from, you know, before I was able to read. So Crazy Cat by George Harriman, um, Pogo by Walt Kelly. These are all books I still have at home, and um, and these guys were masters. I mean, they, you know, very few people had the skills of these uh, guys so, like that. So your your opening into the world was really the Sunday comics, but yeah. then once you started to really get fall in love, and you started to look back into history and yeah. see who the big names were, and and, yes. and draw from them. And I will say though that in um, you know, since that time, we, there are some wonderful masters of, of uh, daily comics and weekly comics. The best, I think, in my lifetime is Bill Waterson, who drew Calvin and Hobbes. Oh, and yeah. then just Calvin like Hobbes, a switch right. got flipped and he stopped doing it. And he, I don't know where he is, he's sort of in hiding. I, I think he releases something on the sly once in a while, but he's like J.D. Salinger. And, yeah. you know, he's the J.D. Salinger Tucked cartoons, away somewhere right? <laughs> and, 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 I, and at the absolute pinnacle of his, of his craft, he was, I mean, I, I mean, it's my opinion, but I think a lot of people would agree, he was just the best. Um, well, I know that Calvin and Hobbes is my personal favorite cartoon. It's outstanding. I have a bunch um, of those books at home as well. And you can you can see just one, uh, one panel out of context, or just one panel by itself. And some people even have them framed in their rooms. That's it's very much uh, still in the cultural zenith. He he never when you leave at the top of your game, you don't really disappear. And maybe there's something to be said for for that as well. But it's always hard to watch a genius stop making stuff for us. Oh, to we want more, you know. Exactly. I we always want more. If he's been doing something for himself, you know, I hope a bootleg copy of it comes out or he or he decides to release, you know, here's the 20 years worth of right. material. That the I same did. thing they're hoping with J.D. Salinger. Yeah. Like, who, what's in the vault when he finally yeah. passes away? Are we going to get our next big masterpiece? Well, let's hope that we get some more Calvin and Hobbes along the so. way. Um, now, you were talking about this mentor that you had at Wesleyan who really was the first person that, you know, you saw doing what you ended up, you know, actually following yep. in your own foot and in his own footsteps without realizing it. Now, turning something you're passionate about like an art form, you know, from a hobby into a career, it's no small feat to be, to be doing something like this, let alone for as long as you've been doing it. Um, when was the first time that someone noticed a piece of your artwork and the way they responded to it, you know, it made you feel like, you know what, maybe, maybe I can really do this. Maybe I can take a crack at this professionally. I think I got encouraged by my parents who were, it seemed to be impressed, you know, I mean, yeah, parents are proud of their kids all the right, time so they, and praise them the and stuff. Stuff on the refrigerator oh, yeah. and yeah, yeah. what have you. Um, and I probably had dreams back then of, you know, making a living at it, but um, I think it was probably not until college when I, you know, um, I was on the editorial board of the Wesleyan Argus, the newspaper, and they gave me this title of graphics editor, which, I, you know, was a little overblown because all I did was, you know, line art, cartoons, and it's good. It looks good on the resume, though, yeah, for I suppose. sure. It's a resume builder. It, it is, but it's, I don't think it ever got me anywhere. But, um, but it was probably in college where, you know, I had I mean, I had repeated deadlines, and they were counting on me to deliver something. So, you know, in and, and one regard, it was a job, a uh, job I loved doing. And, you know, I've you know, paid in college, but the idea that someone would pay me for drawing cartoons was seemed like some miracle to me at the time. And it could give you a realistic sense of what the expectations I think of it did. Of yeah. doing it at a higher level would, would yeah. look like, and right? And what sort of quality? I mean, I have to concentrate. It couldn't just be a scribble like the stuff I would do with my brothers. It, you know, the, the end result, you, you work at it and, you know, um, revise it and refine it. And it um, you know, probably takes longer than people realize. On, on that note, how many stages do you think you go through when you're developing a cartoon? The weekly ones I do the now. The weekly ones, yeah. Um, how many always, phases of, of coming well, back to it do you... You know, I usually try to read the paper um, early. I read the paper, you know, several days a week, the Record Journal, to figure out if I've got a subject that's worthy of a cartoon. And, you know, I, um, I go running a lot. I, I, you know, run a lot. I used to run a lot of marathons. When I'm running, that's what clears so my you're head. you're a real runner. You yeah, I run, run, marathons. I run 20 full marathons. <laughs> not, not a jogger, no, no. a runner. <laughs> About, okay. yeah, 50 half marathons. And now I'm, I draw the line at half marathons, and I don't even... I didn't even do one last year. But that's what would clear my head the most, or other forms of physical exercise, or even sometimes just driving. But, um, but in terms of the, uh, the mechanics of the actual illustration, I always do at least two thumbnails just to get the composition right. Mm. Um, and sometimes three, four, five of them um, before I 
get out my real paper, my the Bristol board that I draw on, and and then get really to work. Put the full size thing together. Yeah. So the um, thumbnails are the answer. They they really help you with um, with the overall design of how it's going to look. The composition. For you. Okay. And a trick that I remember learning when I was I used to go to the Record Journal office and do my work there once a week. There was somebody there, may have been a photographer, who said. Um, Hold a mirror up. Get draw your your drawing and then hold it up. Uh, hold a mirror or hold it to a mirror, and um, right away you'll see if it's skewed in any way. If you're you know favoring one side or the other, um, I don't do that anymore because I think I've figured out how to understand You've if my ingrained it more naturally. Yeah, if, if my um, uh, composition is is um, strong. All right. So on that note, since my next question was actually going to go directly to the kind of tools that you do use in this process, um, you've been working as a cartoonist for over four decades now, yep. which is a wonderful opportunity for us in this conversation to examine how your passion and how your craft has really evolved over time. Because you know, time changes everything and everything has to you know, keep up and evolve as we go forward. So I was curious about starting with the tools since you were discussing a little bit about your process and how you go from thumbnails and then bring out the real paper that you would use and what have you. What tools did you use when you first started creating cartoons and your characters and, and how have those tools changed and updated throughout four decades? Yeah. Uh, well, when I was a kid, it was pencils and crayons. I mean, and, um, my did you grandfather, have a favorite, a favorite color crayon? <laughs> no, probably no? not. <laughs> I, I, I've always had a favorite color Which crayon. Which burnt sienna. Forest green. Okay, that's a nice color. I loved forest green my whole life. Oh, yeah. I, like your, I like your style. It's a good color. Um, no, it was just you know, Crayola, 64 of them. I mean, I did have the other siblings, so we all shared that. And I didn't have that, that problem no, as much, okay. the, the sharing issue. Yeah. <laughs> um, but so when I was in college, I, I don't think I was using the crow quill pen but but that you know I, I eventually went to a bottle of India ink and a steel point nib you know crow quill pen uh, it's a hunt 107 and um, that got suggested to me while I was in college I um, met uh, there was a professional cartoonist um, doing some pretty big league stuff in Merritt and Warren Sattler and I a girlfriend at the time knew his family and and uh, I met him. I went to his house, and oh, nice. all I wanted to know was what he used, and it was India ink and a Hunt 107 nib, and I use that to this day. Yeah, obviously, if you see someone out there doing it and making it, maybe what, what do you use? I want to use right. what you use. And Warren was outstanding. I mean, I, I, uh, he was he drew the uh, the Jackson Twins, which were a daily, you know, international um, uh, strip, and, and the comics page, um, and he also worked for National Lampoon and oh, other. Wow. Yeah, he he was something I recognized. <laughs> very very skilled guy, and um, you know I'm not saying that I've developed skills like his, but I use a pen. He but you use the same tools, yeah, that's right? Absolutely. So and for a while there, so I started out that way, and I use Bristol board, smooth Bristol board as as the paper because you'll you know you'll rip this kind of paper to shreds with a with a steel pen point. Um, so it's kind of thicker. Um, for a while, I I found it was quicker to use uh, felt tip pens. Okay. But they don't give you the organic, lively line that uh, that you know, wet India ink and a steel pen give you. So, even though it takes longer and it's messier, and sometimes I spill it, um, it makes a better cartoon. So it makes it more vibrant. You're saying the lines it's, are. It makes, to, in my mind, in mm -hmm. my eye, it makes it more alive. Yeah, and I still so, and I today I edit, I scan it and edit in Photoshop, or I'm I'm learning another program called Medibang that I may I may go to. So you're still learning new programs and updating your tools to this day. Yeah, wow. always, and I always will. But I, in a way, I have to because you know the now that I am using a computer, they change. The old you tools know, don't apply anymore. They right? stop supporting old software. Um, so anyway, to to get back to when I first started, um, I think 100% of editorial cartoons when I first started were in black and white. Okay. If there were any in color, it was a very rare thing. I don't think there were. So all you needed to do was get a black and white image uh, suitable for publication. And there were, so there was non-reproducible light blue. People would use, if you look at originals of cartoons, like at a cartoon art museum or when there's a, a temporary show somewhere, oftentimes you'll see the light blue. They don't have to erase it because it's not photo reproducible. So okay. you know, they, they leave it there and then they put their black ink over it. And back in the um, 80s when I started, in the 90s, there would be a uh, graphics, uh, 
shading film, like a graphic screen, either see-through graphics or zip -a tone it would be dots or lines or other patterns, and it would make your grays. So you, you know, get your razor knife and you put over, um, like, can people see this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, those are uh, these see-through graphic screens or zip -a tone that's what the guy's pants are there. The red stuff, uh, which reproduces as black, um, this is how you made grays. Okay. Or you cross-hatched, which was a lot more time-consuming, and cross-hatching is centuries old, and it's how people made shading and pen and ink drawings you know, forever and ever. But I think it's a lost art today, because now we've got Photoshop. And we don't have to shade in that fashion, so no one learns how to do it anymore. It's optional. You could do it, and it, it so gives like it a cursive. different look. In, in, yeah. in elementary school, it's like That's cursive right. these days. It's something you can learn. It's kind of the long way, and it's more, and you can you know, come up with a, um, a final version of your cartoon that's nothing but ink and paper and that's you know the, the finished version you can hold in your hand it looks just like it looks when it's published right but I decided uh, when the record journal told me you know we can have full color at no extra cost on every page you know, I did a couple of them and it took so much longer I went back to black and white and then I said boy those color ones really look good so eventually I just caved and I spend more time than I used to but um, I much prefer the look of a full color cartoon. Not just highlight colors, like I see some of the, um, the national uh, editor editorial cartoonists will just have two or three colors to highlight parts of their drawing. I, I think if you're gonna use color, full color is the way to go. If you're gonna go color, go all Because I grew up with comic books and the Sunday funnies and right. they were full color and very colorful. I remember the, the full color Sunday comics were the only ones that really got me excited because sure. when you see that, that color insert, something about it just made my brain come alive and I was like oh this is for me yeah. and I think that's how they got all the kids no Sunday color comics I never me. read any other ones that were black and white I only remember the, the daily ones, ones no no only the Sunday ones got me the daily ones are really tiny today <laughs> now as, as someone who has turned out a regular cartoon every week for more years than I've personally been alive um, I would imagine you can speak to the value of practice and dedication to one's craft so as a seasoned veteran what expectations do you set for yourself and your work when you sit down to draw a cartoon? And I guess that really comes down to, like, how do you define success in your workshop? I have a point to make. Sometimes I don't. It might be obvious sometimes. I'll just, you know, um, draw something that's uh, topical, mm -hmm. you know, related to the news of the day and maybe something just a little bit goofy that doesn't make any particular point. But if I have a point to make, hopefully I make it clearly or... Uh, make a point that, that gets people talking right. and debating with each other. Um, in terms of uh, the technical aspects of it, um, you know, need to be um, punchy, I guess. Like, it's, um, you don't have to sit there and try to understand what's going on. It's You want it to leap off the page quick. at some you're, point. You're, yeah, you, you, yeah, you um, digest it quickly mm. and understand it, hopefully, quickly. So usually if you look at an image and it takes you more than eight or ten seconds to figure out what's going on, then you know that you've missed the mark and you'd have to go back and re-examine. Right. Or if it's really late at night and I'm tired, I'd say that's good enough this week. <laughs> Which, when you're turning <laughs> out a cartoon sometimes. every week for 40 years, <laughs> sometimes that happens. I think you're given a couple, a couple bye weeks for sure. Now, one might think with the expectations, like you're talking about in the deadlines of the professional world, even drawing cartoons can sometimes be more stressful than fun. It can be stressful, but um, there's something about um, you know finishing it and being able to submit it. And I used to have to drive to Meriden with it. Even I lived in New Britain for a while, and um, you know when I could email it, that's the great. Sense, Scan, right? psh, email, and then um, it's just a sense that you you know you took care of your assignment and. Um, Something's completed, so week after week, you know, I get something that I finish, and um, and again, this is a, this is a side career. It's the only drawing I do is the Record Journal cartoon right now. So I have my day job managing construction projects in, in Hartford Healthcare and a hospital network, and once a week I get to use another part of my brain. Yeah. Um, answer to a different boss, do something. I'm not saying my day job isn't fun. It's there's a lot of enjoyment in that, but different kind of fun. Absolutely. Exercise in a different, your exercise is your brain and your creativity in a completely different fashion. And it's in the middle of the week usually. It used to be Wednesday nights. I deliver on Thursday nights mostly now and that's fine. It's still well in advance of the deadline. But it's not sectioned off to the weekend. It's, 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 it's part of no, your that's, work week. Right? right. And that's when it appears. But yeah. I have to complete, I have to deliver it to them by Friday morning. Okay. So what also happens sometimes is I do get tired. I don't quite finish it. 
and I wake up earlier on Friday morning, and sometimes the, uh, the night's sleep uh, clears my head, and I, you know, maybe I haven't inked it yet, and I say, ooh, I'm going to change the wording because this is better, this thing I thought of overnight or that I just thought of now with my coffee. Sometimes uh, so that, that extra period of gestation really brings up something yeah, special and new that pops into your it head. Does. Clarity. As, if I'm exhausted, especially, and that, you know, as I get older, maybe that happens now, more. As a, as a former and possibly again high school teacher, I can tell you the I waited until the morning of because I might have a good idea. I've heard that from my students plenty of times. It doesn't always work. Sometimes you get good material. Sometimes it's very, very hurriedly written paper yeah. and cat scratch. But do you feel like um, with? you know, meeting these, these deadlines and, and, and being so dedicated to this craft for so long that you're still growing as an artist? And after all these cartoons, are you still waking up excited about what you get to draw next? Absolutely, very much so, yeah. I mean, I wake up sometimes wondering, oh boy, I don't have a subject yet, you know, how am I gonna do What this? am I gonna draw next? A it little always, bit of worry, it always right? comes together, it all, and I'm almost always perfectly happy with it when I, when I you know, pull it together. And I, like your, the students that you're talking mm -hmm. about, I mean, it's probably true if they claim they work best under a deadline. I think a lot of people do. And we all do. Yeah. We all really do. It's, it's a scary thing that ticking clock really puts it yep. right, right in front of you and says this has to happen. Mm -hmm. I know some uh, sketch comedy writers who don't know how to work without the ticking clock. That right. So they just they, they wait until about five hours for the end of the day, and it's like, okay, now let's get serious, because now it is serious. And some people swear they have to work like that, and some students have told me year after year it's the only way they can work. But sometimes having things come to you on Friday morning should be more of a a luxury than, than a, and usually a method of madness. It well, <laughs> might be a way to improve it at the last minute before right. clicking send to the editor. That extra night of sleep really gives you time to really digest and sometimes yeah. things clarify yes, when, when you wake up. True. That's why you keep that little notepad by the bed too yeah. for those one-liners that you think of when you're sleeping you can't remember yeah. when you wake up. I do that. Now um, we've talked about how, how time really can change almost anything and you know given enough time Fashion will change really quickly, but given out of time, even even science changes, right? Our understanding of the world will change. So there really nothing is safe. Yeah, Pluto is not a planet. Anymore. Pluto is not a planet. Then is a planet. Then it's not a planet. So <laughs> right. it really depends on the day you wake up and what year. You know what information is relevant at the time. Now your career has spanned eight presidential administrations. How has the political cartoon itself really evolved throughout your time in the industry? In the industry, yeah. Um, yeah, they look different. I think they look simpler now because um, print media and daily newspapers, for sure, have gotten smaller. So I think when you look at a cartoon from the 50s or 60s or 70s, um, they, they're bigger and yeah. they tend to have a lot more going on in them. And mine do as well. I mean, I think we, you know, when they're running larger, you can put more detail in it that will be visible and noticed. Um, and... Uh, they're just, they're all simpler now. So it's really the size of the paper itself is getting smaller, so factor, the size yeah. of the cartoons are getting smaller yeah. in relation. I mean, I, I work in the same uh, original size I, that I have for 30 years at least. Okay. I used to work in much bigger, I guess these are bigger from the very first uh, few years, but you know, I haven't changed my, the size that I'm comfortable working with in terms of an original. So you draw but, the original in the same size, yeah. and then they, they reshape yeah. it to fit it's what like, they need. Pretty much exactly like that. And that's been probably 30 years worth of those exact dimensions are the size I work in. I didn't realize that they would be shrink. For some reason in my head, I thought the different size cartoons, you just decided to draw this one smaller and decided to draw this. So that you're drawing all of them the same size, mm -hmm. and they're making that determination yes. after the fact. That's correct. Based on what ads they have to fit or what's, right. what and, articles yeah. or how long. Mm -hmm. Well, that makes more sense than how I, for some reason, thought that it was done, so I'm glad I asked. Um, well, now that you've, you mentioned that you have a full-time job that you do, and then this has always been part-time freelance work for the last 40 years, but now I believe that your full-time job is coming to a... I've decided to retire in September. Congratulations. That's an amazing <laughs> monumental decision. Yeah, I've been at this hospital for almost 33 years. and uh, So you're a fixture there as well? Yeah, I'll miss... Uh, there's a lot I'll miss about that job, but... Um, but I'm energized and really excited about, you know, like a, a next chapter or second career. This this will become, you know, I'll be an illustrator, a cartoonist. Uh, full time. Full time as a freelancer. So that brings me to my, my next question. Do you have any drawing projects in the work that you're really excited about? Um, I know that single panel is really what you're well known for, but is there a possible return to long form? Are we bringing uh, Timmy the Human Diamond back? <laughs> we to may bring him back. Just see him in, in all his glory? <laughs> because of your interest. Um, <laughs> it, it, nothing concrete right now, but um, 
you know, if it looks like I can work on a project of my own like that for an extended time, I, I might do it. What I'll, what I'll try to do is find uh, clients. Mm. You know, about uh, 25 years ago, I tested the waters. Um, I worked out a job sharing at, at Hartford Hospital with someone else. We both wanted to go half time. She was a mother of very small children and wanted to spend more time with them, and I was trying to become an illustrator. So I had a few clients. I had some major publishing houses that I did work for. Um, I, the people there, would, I don't think they're still in the same job, so my contacts are long gone, but uh, that's the kind of work I'd like, I'd like to try You'd to like get. You'd like to, so. to return to. Yeah. There's a little more variance and uh, a hired gun, per se, yeah. where you get to draw something new and take different approaches to a different kind of work. Yeah, and, it's, and you get an assignment and you know, meet authors and... Uh, it's pretty nice. Is that life. form of the idea of collaborating with an author on a project we really excites you? Since yeah. I, I imagine you do a lot of work alone in your exactly. workshop, so the idea of collaborating is something that could be new for this phase it's, of your career? Well, um, you know, my day job, I worked on construction projects. And right. You're in part of a team, and I do love working as a team. Um, everybody contributes something different. You get together, you know, months go by, and then you have an end product, a new building or a new department that you've renovated. And, you know, wrap it up in a bow, and you've got, you know, it's done. Right. This is, um, I speak with the editors uh, occasionally and the writers. For the most part, I just read the paper and come up with the ideas, and it's, it's just me. So it might, be, it might get lonely. But I have, you know, young children at home and a wife, so. So they'll feel, they'll, they'll feel those, those quiet <laughs> they're moments they're very supportive. Anyhow. Yes, they're, they're very supportive of it. I'm sure that there are some aspiring cartoonists that are watching us have this conversation either right now or on some later viewing when it's replayed. Before we come to a close, I'd really love to give you an opportunity. Do you have any, any insights or advice that you can offer to them as they begin to draw their way into the world? Um, I would say just keep drawing. I mean, draw as much as you can. Um, you know, if you can develop your own style, I think it took me kind of a while to do that, um, but you know, look at the professionals and copy things and find your own voice. And um, I guess believe in yourself. And you know, uh, in my case, it's, it's sort of a dream uh, deferred, and and that can work too. I mean, uh, um, you know, you can do something else for a while and get back to it if you're if you're still passionate about it, or do it on the side. Um, but I would I would encourage anyone who's interested in in this sort of thing to just do it, draw, show your drawings to people, get feedback. And so put yourself out there and. Take another stab at it every time that you finish something. Keep going. Yes, and I, you know, one of the things I have to learn, and you know, maybe younger people have a better sense of it, is where where are the clients? I mean, the mm. print, you know, newspapers are folding up and dying, and and they're letting their editorial cartoonists go, even when the paper survives. They just cut them. They so don't it's, have re it's really feeling like the end of an era, maybe. It's feeling like a very much a dwindling um, supply of, of customers, and. Um, but you know, there's a lot more online, and you know, maybe my teenage kids will help me figure out uh, how to do that sort of work. One door shuts and the internet yeah. window opens. Right. We just got to give it time to see exactly where that window leads. But I will say, having had the opportunity with with the Hercules team to go through 40 years of, of your cartoons, the last thing I would ever say was to call this a dream deferred. If anything, <laughs> it true. was. Uh, no, I've been I've been lucky <laughs> enough to have someone. Yeah, uh, no, I just it's it's been um, to the 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 ability to do something full time and to raise a family and to still have your passion and your workshop and your voice and to express yourself for 40 years and to be involved in the town, local and global politics, it's something that should be commended. Yeah, thank you. And I, that's I, one of the reasons why we have you here. I do feel blessed that, that it has worked out in that regard for me, yes. Well, the town of Wallingford also feels the same. Okay. So um, we would just like to take this moment to thank you for being here and to thank you guys at home for watching. We will be bringing Kevin back for another long-form interview very soon to talk about his connection to Wallingford, the Record Journal, and our local politics throughout the years. Thank you for watching.